thank you for joining us, Dan. Let me just add a word or two, if I might, uh, to that very fine introduction. Um, it was some years ago that uh, Lou Harris was one of the early uh, political pollsters, and uh, uh, he gave some he gave the results of his most recent poll to President Kennedy, and began to uh, interpret them. And uh, Kennedy famously said, "Just give me the numbers, Lou. I'll figure out what they mean." As if you know, right? you just take the numbers, I'll, I'll look at the results. That was a long time ago, and politics has changed dramatically since then. Uh, people who do survey research, uh, uh, and some of them have the kind of, not very many, but a few have the kind of academic credentials that Stan brings to this, uh, with a doctor here from this university, uh, and Ben Yankelovich brought that kind of uh, understanding. Uh, there, there's just been a handful. But over the years, uh, the people who have taken these surveys, some of, a few of them have actually become deeply engaged in consulting and shaping the strategy of the candidate. It's not simply taking the numbers and conducting uh, uh, focus groups, but it is rather that the candidates have looked to them, uh, and not only in their campaigns, but then in their governance for help uh, and understanding of the electorate to maintain a bond to the electorate. And Stan has been right at the top of this field, and you heard, in fact, the book, I mean, the fact that you've got the national leaders, he's writing the book about the national leaders of the United States, uh, of Britain, of South Africa, of Israel, and of Bolivia. I think that gives you some sense of the range that he has brought to his work. Uh, I had the experience and privilege of uh, watching Stan in action during the early time of the Clinton administration. And he was not on the White House staff, but I can tell you that more than anybody I knew, he shaped the strategy of the White House. Uh, he wrote uh, papers for President Clinton that came in and they became the starting point for all conversations about strategy. And uh, you know, you, the, he who controls the, 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 the document, that controls the agenda, and often controls the outcome. Uh, and that's what he did. But I also want you to understand that uh, Stan Greenberg stands for and represents something broader and deeper. He has had a long-term commitment uh, to social justice, uh, and, and, and that's been very important to him. Uh, he, he is married to a member of Congress who shares that passion. Uh, Rosa Blar from, from Connecticut as a Democrat shares that passion. But I want to read you one sentence uh, from his book, early in his book. <coughs> Uh, when he was talking about working for Democrats, as he had, and going all the way back to Eugene McCarthy and Robert Kennedy, and trying to make, for early in his generation, trying to make, early in his life, trying to make decisions about supporting them, uh, or which one. He said, I've spent most of my professional and political life in disparate settings and disparate ways trying to recreate a multiracial majority opposed to inequality and private excess, and finding ways to build a society where equality and community matter. I think that's very much the essence of who he is. And I want you to understand that before we started this conversation tonight. So, Dan, you've had a chance now to reflect. This is the first time you really have written about the people you've worked with uh, in this open and candid way. You've had a chance to observe their leadership. Tell us what you've learned. Okay. <clears throat> um, thank you very much. Uh, the, uh, uh, this is very generous. It's very generous um, of the uh, Kennedy School of the Center, uh, the uh, IOP, to provide this you know, forum. Um, I came. I came here um, when I uh, published to Americans, and so I immediately went to David um, at the outset of this to um, to have a to begin here. Um, uh, I got launched in Britain and launched in Washington, uh, but this is the beginning of the launch. Uh, so this is one of the first opportunities to speak to a um, to a, an American audience um, about the about the book. Um, the uh, Jim is great. He's you know um, we uh, there's the, the, the young people who come through always are the folks who teach us uh, about the, the the country and they we know, we we appear not to lose uh, track of them um, as they say in touch with everybody who still works there and so we have good network strong networks good parties. Uh, for those who, uh, who work there. Um, and David, um, I you know, admire David. I, you know, I, first of all, I got, I've been watching David as you have 
uh, interpreting the last uh, these momentous events over the last two years uh, in, the, in, in the country. Um, I uh, I don't know whether David's good. I mean, you should, people I agree with, I think, are smart. <laughs> so the David's very smart. <laughs> the, I, but when I look at events as I, as I develop, as I look at a debate or I look at a particular turning point, uh, I'm watching for what he's going to say because he usually gets it right. Um, and I also think if we're looking at, if we're looking ahead to how this thing evolves, I think we try to we go back and recreate those those moments, uh, big, those big turning points uh, over the last couple of years. I think uh, David will be uh, will have written that history in a, in a contemporary time. Uh, I also worked with him in the White House and the. At a, at a time when it was very tense, uh, with the president who had, had uh, lost popularity, and one of the this, my book is about you know bold leaders elected in times of change and how they struggle to bring people with them. Uh, and as I as I've been t talking about the book, I've also it's become clearer and clearer to me that they all crash. You know, they all fail. They all disappoint. They all betray. Uh, the uh, people perceive that they you know betray you know betray their brought them into, into office. Um, we came in at a time when you know Bill Clinton was, you know, was strug uh, struggling to succeed. The White House was, was being reorganized. He came in as a with a history of working in Republican uh, White House. But I, um, I, I think we can look back on, I think, with pride on the, our time uh, together. We always worked together. We're, there was always, I think, a trust um, that we uh, built up you know, there. I, his, Trust his integrity on this, his advice that he was giving the, the president, and, and also his patriotism. I think he, uh, I think he came, genuinely came into the White House um, at a time the country uh, needed him at another point of change, um, and you know, took the chance to serve another president. So, I'm, so I begin this with great respect for David and uh, his role. Uh, this book is a um, is a memoir. But, you know, when I see what I can. But here you were to have back to the skin. Uh, the, um, uh, <coughs> oh, I okay, can you hear me? Very good. Uh, it's very scary when you have your words read back to you. Though this this is a memoir in which I when I when I turned in the book, you know, it was 750 pages long. It was like too long, um, and it was not revealing enough. Because I would that is I would tell I would tell. You know, I you know I decided to tell anecdotes, that is to tell stories. You know, as they, um, but this book is so different from anything that I've done. Everything I've done before is it's analytical, um, it's third person. You know, when I write, I you know I throw you know I throw ideas at the page. I you know I, uh, the you know I throw numbers at the page as well. But you know, and it's you know and you're you're engaging, and I can write about write about ten pages uh, a day. Um, but when you write a memoir. Um, and I was trying in doing this to be, first of all, fair to the to the leaders I was uh, writing about. I wanted to try to be revealing about what I do. I wanted to be frank and honest about it. Um, I also want, um, tried to do something. Um, I tried to write it in a way, if you read the book, I think you'll see that each of these things have a story to, that, uh, that flows. Because I tried, in each case, to write about it only with what I knew at the time, and never to use things that I could not have known um, to reinterpret what I was doing and saying. Because I think you can't read this, you can't get the drama right, you know, um, and you can't and you can't understand your thinking and you know unless you unless you keep yourself in that context. In fact I wrote this in uh, not just first person, I wrote it in present tense. Now I didn't publish it in present tense. The, the poor publisher had to you know unwrap that. But it, but it, for me it was a critical piece to being able to say what's going on to keep me from Using, you know, the future um, to reinterpret this um, and to, you know, to change the sequence. So, um, the but the other piece was getting the, was getting myself to put myself, you know, into it. And I didn't, you know, I was not self-conscious that this was my goal of life, and that's what motivated, um, you know, what I did. I wrote that in the introduction, uh, but that's that's something that became clearer to me as I wrote this book, uh, not clear to me um, as I, you know, in my life. <laughs> I mean, I'm doing it. Um, but it, it only became clear to me what motivates me through this. Through the, why do I go work for these leaders? Why do I, you know, why do I work there? And it's one. It's one of it. Well, part of what motivated the book was, you know, um, watching the political consulting and polling being um, um, 
not just the way it's being portrayed, but my increasing perception of what I do um, as becoming manipulative, um, um, turning things to be to be the opposite of what they're intended, um, for words to mean the opposite, so that so social security privatization becomes inter intergenerational responsibility. We find words that you know try to communicate the opposite meaning, um, and a sense that it may well be that the techniques that I learned here when I came to Harvard. I came here because you know, he had been um, at, in political science um, at, um, at Harvard. Uh, he, had, uh, he died before, before I uh, came, but he, but he wrote a book that was, um, came out that was a, a half-written half uh, called Responsible Electorate, in which he, you know, which he said that you know, there's a simple message here, which is that people aren't fools, that they, that they care about policy, that, that, they, that their, what preferences they have on policy matter, ideology matters, or partisanship matters. Um, that information matters, um, and respecting people. But I was in a looking at a consulting community, you know, fraternity, if that, uh, that um, um, was making, in some ways, making leaders less respectful of people, and, and rather being held accountable to people, um, being able to escape accountability. So I wasn't sure. One of my motivations was to figure out what I thought about my profession. Um, I didn't call myself a pollster. Uh, the you know didn't self-identify as a pollster. We could use the word. I'd look around and say, what are they talking about? So the um, first was to get clarity on that. And there's a lot. There's, I, I spent a lot of time with them talking specifically um, on some of the things that you know led me to my greatest doubts, including you know including Dennis Ross um, um, saying that the that the Syrian agreement did not happen uh, because of my polls. Um, and what does that lead me to, to do, rethink, or lead me to think about what I do? So one was doubts about what I do, but the other was the fact that it was diminishing leaders. Um, that the leaders that I was working for were being diminished by this process, and Bill Clinton in particular, um, seen as a leader who you know, put his finger to the wind, the one who was, you know, I think most attacked as being uh, older. Um, and so part of my motivation was to look at them. I was pretty confident that I would you know, come away from you know, come away from this with them because uh, I understood their their purpose. You know, I came to I came to this because of my purpose. You know, I you know I began it was the Robert Kennedy campaign, 19, you know, 1968 that defined where I stood politically. You know, my generation they're defined by whether you were Eugene McCarthy or Robert Kennedy or Richard Nixon, um, and that you know set you on a course for a you know a life. Uh, a life. <laughs> The, but so it was, there's a political purpose of what took me into politics and into the campaign. But all these leaders had a purpose uh, that took them, you know, uh, uh, and, it, and it was a, you know, particular, you know, moment in time in each of these cases, you know, a, you know, change elections uh, in which what they were offering, they they were right, you know, they were right for that moment. There are a whole range of other reasons why they emerged to the top at the particular moment. But they they all had. A purpose that was relevant and, and that um, drove the history um, in these critical change, you know, elections. So I understood, you know, that they had, you know, a purpose that took them um, uh, into politics. Um, I also uh, came to know from the, you know, from the writing of the book, is that these leaders were all complicated and more, you know, and more complicated than I knew at the time, um, and and more, much more interesting. And so. And again, going back to the reason why I wrote the book, I looked at the, the political leaders were being diminished by the campaign, the perception of the campaigns they ran, um, and the use of you know consulting and polling and uh, you know to advance their issues. Uh, when in fact I understood that they had a much you know bigger purpose. You know, Nelson Mandela was consumed. I mean, Mandela was Paul, um, and being in touch with people. And, and Nelson, Mandela. And Nelson Mandela was consumed with Paul. He went to focus. Uh, he, uh, you know, there were critical turning points uh, in the ANC, both his campaign and in the period of governance. You know, where he got it, uh, where others didn't, um, uh, and because he, you know, he viewed as part of being a leader, um, that in fact was this was this aspect of him, to some extent, with Clinton, um, that um, and then beginning to, then getting a sense of other leaders like uh, Lincoln. And, and Roosevelt, but I decided that leaders' solicitousness of the solicitous of public opinion actually made them stronger leaders and more likely successful leaders. I think it normatively that is, I think uh, that you know, leaders ought to be 
held accountable ought to be in print, ought to be responsive you know, uh, people, particularly those that have a you know a, a purpose, because they're more likely to succeed in that purpose um, if they have if they have that kind of engagement with people. But when I first started it, um, you know, there are a couple places where it's sort of mechanical. The you know, one of them was whether they have you know mandate and pledges and that they keep their pledges, and I. I, I Put that aside. It's not that interesting um, because the voters itself don't think it's that interesting. Uh, if you want to ask, I'll explain what I mean by that. What I I started by looking at the spaces where Clinton did not poll. You know, and and I could do that for all of them. You know, so that Clinton, you know, in the whole year leading up to him running for president, did not conduct a survey while he was head of the Democratic Leadership Council and developing it and giving many speeches on his overall on his vision. Did not poll. Uh, he did not poll before he, you know, ran for announced for president and, and gave that you know, speech. I, you know, wrote desperate memos that any you know, anybody running it for a congressional race would you know would do more research than you're doing. Uh, the but he didn't poll before he you know announced. He did not poll before he gave. He started the new covenant speeches, the three defining speech, laying out his vision. He, you know, did poll. Uh, the first poll happened right after the uh, the first of the new uh, covenant speech. Uh, he, um, you know, when we got to the, um, uh, when we you know, got to the, to, after the election and, and the economic team was together um, and, you know, basically accepted a, you know, the, uh, a cap, you know, on the deficit, you know, which was, you know, a number for having the deficit, um, you know, the deficit that greatly accelerated, accepting that cap basically said the investments um, that he had run on could, couldn't happen. Uh, not without polling. I mean, with that. So one one part of me said, why not just simply look, identify the fact that these people, you know, you know, even though they poll within the parameters that they set, um, they are, you know, they are there are big areas where they don't, and therefore they're more interesting. Actually, what I decided is that I, what I really respect Bill Clinton for was how engaged he was with people. What was more interesting was not the, the you know that you know the spaces where he was. <coughs> Reflecting public opinion, what was more interesting was how engaged he was with people, how much energy he gained from from being with people, whether it was a rope line or whether you know you know rallies to try to come back in you know New Hampshire when he went down, but also when he had to rally support for his economic plan or health care. But with his, his engagement with people, and they <laughs> carried him through later periods because of that relationship. Um, and Mandela, you know, he. Um, he, you know, he understood that if you're a democratic leader, that you you have to have a you have to have people with you. You have to have an understanding for people. He also was very he also would lecture large crowds about their responsibilities. But he was but he also you know until he became firm of where he was going, you know he would he would he would he would, he would take he would listen to the report. He he sat through three hour I've seen him sit through a three hour full presentation. Uh, uh, he wanted to head the, you know, head up the research for the you know, campaign. He went to focus group. The, uh, you know, when the, when they were negotiating over long periods, he, you know, he would, you know, he would, after seeing focus groups, get that people after three years of him being out of prison, but there being no constitution yet, and on which no framework for elections, you know, he understood that people were viewing him as out of touch, they see as out of touch. Um, and it totally changed the way they went out into the country to try to bring people with them uh, in the negotiations, which had a big impact on what they could negotiate for and what were the terms of the Constitution. Uh, and so, and other critical points, he, you know, you know, he, you know, he turned. So, the I came to respect these leaders as leaders who were solicitous of public opinion and moved public opinion. Ayo Barak, Ayo Barak was, uh, as the Israeli Prime Minister, did not have a popular touch. Was not that popular. Didn't have a popular touch. Not you know not the kind of empathy that Clinton had, not the kind of charisma that Tony Blair had, you know, but he was trusted on security. He was the most decorated soldier in the history of the of Israel, the IDF. Uh, he um, he went to you know Camp David with um, his popularity below George Bush's approval rating at its lowest. Uh, he had lost his government. Uh, he had lost a vote of confidence, and he, the government, he didn't, you know, wasn't forced to lead the election only because the Arab parties uh, stayed. Um, and that was, the, that was the basis on which he went 
to Camp David to negotiate the most fundamental things you can imagine. Um, and I'm not sure what the comparable thing that an American president would negotiate. This is not some side issue. This is the character of the state that puts the capital, the making of the borders, you know, the, um, you know, what, you know, what, uh, he was negotiating fundamental things. And Jerusalem was a red line in which he really said he would never deny Jerusalem. He ran on it. Um, but during the course of a month, we had our polls, two-thirds said that they would not support a, a, an agreement with the Palestinians that included a divided Jerusalem. By the end of the effort, at a very studied process of, of, of passing information to the country to draw them into the, the discussion, um, you know, by the end of the Camp David agreement, we had a majority of the country in favor of an agreement with the divided Jerusalem. So leaders use their legitimacy to move, to educate, to move them. Um, these are leaders, all, again, all, all of these leaders have the sense of where they want to go. Um, but their ability to move people is a central part of their leadership. And the, what we should disparage is not leaders who are solicitous of public opinion, but leaders such as George Bush and Cheney. Uh, you know, when, you know, when Cheney, when asked by Mark Raddatz, uh, about the two-thirds of the country who thought it was a mistake to have gone into Iraq, and he said, so, we don't take our, we don't take our advice from you know, public opinion polls and focus groups. Um, to me, that's a measure. That response does not define strong leaders, but define strong leader are leaders who accept the obligation that they have to build a relationship with people, to bring them with them um, on their project, to, ed you know, to educate, um, that relationship is central to their success, central to being a, democra a democratic you know, leader. The, um, and so I came away from, you know, from this much more you know, respectful you know, of, the, you know, of, uh, of these leaders, both because of their purpose, their, you know, the, the purpose that brought them to office, their respect, you know, respect for people. Um, they all defined a particular moment and uh, uh, they controlled the definition of their elections, which set the stage for their governance. And they all and they all lost support. They all crashed, and then had to, you know, went through a process of trying to, you know, to win, um, you know, to win people, you know, uh, back. Um, um, I came at the at the end of the at the end of the day. You know, I came out of this, you know, much less certain about what I do. Um, the in a general sense, uncertain about the. You know the the tactics of over you know being you know more important the thrill of the game being more important than the purpose. The and and there's evidence of generational change in this. If you look at their polls amongst people who are consultants, that you know people in the '60s who uh, you know, you know that generation, my generation, um, you know that the fact they're motivated by ideology or partisanship or policy issues, you know the much bigger proportion as their Central motivation as you get to you know, younger generations is much more about the thrill of the game as a motivation for doing this. Now I'm not sure how the Obama election may have changed that. Um, my guess is there's a new generation, just as everything else has changed. My guess is there's a, a new generation um, that is doing what I do, um, and rather than you know Robert Kennedy being kind of a defining point, you know where you were, you know this election is probably a defining point when we look ten years from now, you know on whose shape. The leaders of the future, it may be, you know, in, you know, in this, you know, in this moment. The, uh, but I came away from what I did uh, with this, um, to, to the extent that it, it is part of a political project of either my, either your own, or the, or that you're working for leaders that you believe in, that you, you, know, you believe in the project that brought them to the, to their, you know, to their uh, battle for you know, leadership and for governance. And the book's about as much about governance. The difficulty of governance as it is about campaigns, and because all these leaders use polling and research during their governance, and you know, and struggle to you know to get the, you know reelected. The I'll just make a final point so we can have a discussion. The you know I, me I mentioned the you know I mentioned the Jerusalem. I mentioned Syria, but I, I mentioned the, uh, uh, Jerusalem. Uh, and in some ways, I learned I learned more from Israel than any of the other places. I learned a lot about myself. Why um, uh, uh, Because I realized I was more Jewish than I knew myself to be. <laughs> so that my Jewishness became part of the exploration of this book. Uh, is something I explore in the in, uh, in the book. And, um, and some of the issues, you know, some of the issues that these are kind of, you know, 
bit arcane, but you know, there's you have a and you reach a point in the Israel uh, Israeli election uh, where I mean the biggest issue for voters in the in, 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 in the first in the first election that I did there was not the peace process and not the economy. The biggest issue was the role of the religious you know the of the Orthodox and religious extremism and the settler extremists, um, not you know not the Rabin's tradition, which was uh, what. Uh, Ava Barak was running on, and not the economy that they were also running. But the biggest issue was the role, you know, of the extremists. Um, and my data continually pointed to um, centrality of that issue. Now, let me let me talk about it because it says something about what I uh, about what I do. Now, I try to understand. I come at a particular a moment of change. I try to understand at this period. You know, I try to dig as deeply into the history. I try to do open, you know, focus groups are as open ended as possible. I'm not part of the of the debates. I'm, not, I'm an outsider, um, so I'm not part of the you know the internal debates that the parties you know have been having. So you know, when you have a position, you know it filters it filters information. The moment you decide what you think is happening or what the issues are, is that you know information tends to be filtered. So I can I step back. I don't know when I'm stepping on toes. You know I'm you know because I don't have a vested interest. Uh, and so you so in Israel. All of the all of the focus groups, you know, what was coming out was the discussion was about the religious, the the, the fundamentalists, the Orthodox, the Shas, which, which was the party in the movement, um, the fundamental, religious fundamental. Right. Um, I would do polls and, and define the election, say what is this election about, you know, governing for everybody versus the religious extremists was was the dominant message, it was the thing that drove, that gave us the, the greatest advantage in the vote, but the leadership of the country just was not willing to have an election that was about the role of religion. It, they thought it dangerous to have an election in which they were debating these questions. Um, that, you know, the, the Zionist parties had brought the religion, always brought religious parties in, Ben Gurion had it, always brought religious parties in to preserve the Jewish character of the state, even though most people describe themselves as secular in, uh, in Israel. Um, and to, so I was putting, I was pushing the religious issue when the, um, um, and I was being attacked for doing this. Uh, now, what I said was that that's an elite, well, I understand the argument, but it, just understand it's an elite decision. Okay, you're making a decision to take this issue off the table, the public wants it on the table. Um, and I found myself as a voice, you know, of people. If there's anything I get fired for, it's for this. <laughs> it's for pushing an issue that is emerging out of the moment, um, that folks are excluding it for a particular you know, reason, but I feel that I have to you know, move people on. Anyway, but the role of faith had goes back to my own um, rejection of my, I lived in an Orthodox family, so how much does that play in, you know, in, my, in my championing this issue? I was very clear about the data, but how much, how, you know, how much was that? Jerusalem, you know, prior to Camp David, I really won't make this last one. Prior to Camp David, um, I had polls that said, uh, that said look, opinion's done now. You know, there's, there's a bunch of things that are at issue. How many settlers to move? What percentage of the, of the territory to get back to the Palestinians? You know, and I watched the things move. It went from 10,000 being acceptable to 20,000 to 30,000 uh, moving settlers. And, um, and I was watching these things move. And I, so I said in a memo, things are done now. But on Jerusalem, I said, they're not moving. Um, and the focus group is very emotional. You know, talk about Jerusalem, and people talk about the removing, it's like severing the head from the body, you know. And I, and I said, Jerusalem's a dead end. I said, all right. Then he proceeded, you know, and Camp David, you know, is not supposed to have any press operation. There was no, you know, communication with, you know, with, you know, with Camp David. They set up a separate operation outside of Camp David. Um, I was snuck into the, uh, the most secure base in Tel Aviv to you know, operate off the secure line. To, to I would talk to uh, Barack daily, um, and he kept testing different state, different you know, stages of, uh, of dealing with Jerusalem. He kept leaking to the press that they were, you know, they he carried men during his biography. He had, you know, they he interviewed uh, some academics who had proposed different ways to deal with Jerusalem. Those things got covered in the press. He kept building a whole series of press stories around it. Opinion moved by the end of majority support. So, what I, what at the end of the book I say, if I can't believe my polls on Jerusalem, 
why should I believe them on anything? I mean, there's nothing more emotional, there's nothing clearer that a leader can't go there. That is, you're not going to be able to move it. You know, at the same, you know, now I had similar recommendations on, in Bolivia on saying you can't export gas through Chile and and, and, and Antonia is here in America, you know, with asylum in, in, in America because of the violence that happened as he tried to do it. So I have other places where I was right about it, but the, uh, I'm very humble about the idea that any of this tells a leader that you can't go there. Now, Ayo Barak was very courageous. You know, he went to Camp David without a gun. You know, he was going to have either an election or a referendum the moment it was over. Um, you know, but how many leaders are that clear in their purpose and that you know that courageous and willing to ignore, you know, ignore the polling and simply believe that they can move the public, you know, if they trust them with information? So, my my sense here is that people who do what I do have to be very careful, very dynamic, very careful and humble uh, with leaders who have uh, real ambitions. Thank you, Sam, for that overview. Let me uh, pursue uh, two or three uh, lines of thought here, questions. Uh, and go a little, probe a little deeper, uh, and we'll, we're, I'm going to have a bit of a conversation with Stan, and then we're going to open this up if we could, because um, we would all welcome your thoughts and comments and questions, especially your questions. The, um, uh, well, we'll come back to this very important sentence you've had, that a, a democratic leader who is solicitous of the public grows strong. And the question is, what does that mean to be solicitous? Uh, I think we could all agree without much debate that a democratic leader needs to hear the voices of the people through focus groups and polling to know what the conversation is and to know how he might talk and what is understood and what is not understood. That, I think, it would be universally agreed upon. It's also true that issues ripen in politics and that uh, you know, knowing how things are ripening allows you some sense of timing. You, you, it's often a democratic leader you want to, you, you don't want to plunge ahead until people are sort of ready. Uh, but when they're ready, then you can move. Um, but the question, of course, the fundamental question is to what extent you should be guided by what the public says in a democracy. After all, it is a democracy. The voice, I mean, you are there as a representative of the people. But how representative do you need to be? And this is an old, old question. That, you know, Edmund Burke's letter to the electors was essentially saying that when I go to Parliament, famous letter saying when I go to Parliament, I go representing you, but I am there to represent you, and I must make independent decisions, and then I will stand for re-election, and you can decide whether I've done a good job. It's first a good question of whether you, know, you really should listen to the voice of the people, and you should be guided by them. Now, don't let that after you left. You know, I, I think Nick Morris, uh, got, you know and made certain pointers, told certain stories publicly, which I think really hurt him. Uh, that he had taken a poll about where he ought to go on vacation. Uh, and that he wanted to go camping because it was sort of seen as a American thing. But more importantly, on the Monica Lewinsky situation, when that story broke, he took an instant poll and determined what his course of action would be. He thought he, he you know, like Dick Mars told him, you can't think it. If you tell the truth, then he said, okay, we'll just have to go the other way, basically. Uh, so there is this question of, in some ways, is Dick Cheney right? What if he had taken a poll and found out two-thirds of the people opposed going into Iraq, but they thought it was really important in the national interest? Would it not be right to go ahead with it, even though you use the polls to educate? So I'm just trying to figure out, where, did, where does this stop and start? And how do you feel? How do you think about that? Um, well, purposely provocative on the on on the use of the word solicitous in public opinion, yeah. uh, and I, uh, I so. <laughs> the but I, but I'm also very clear that the all, all these leaders have a purpose. I mean, they have their their reason why they ran. They were and that was to find and it was that's what brought them. It's why they it, because they at that particular moment, a, a Bill Clinton or, or a Tony Blair rose amongst the top other uh, leaders. You know, Tony Blair, but Gordon Brown at that moment. Well, I can talk about the reason, but there was, but he had there was things that motivated him. They, they were right at that moment, given the and the, the desire for uh, for change and what they and what they accentuated. Um, and so that purpose defines their you know their present. Now, the what happened? I'll speak specifically to the to the more stuff. After we after we lost the, the 
the congressional elections? 94. 90 is 94. That's the first two years in. Right. The, he no longer had a you know, congressional majority, to, to be honest, to advance the agenda of which he was elected. Um, and I think Bill Clinton, I think, was very much at sea in terms of what's the project, what's the purpose, why, you know, why, you know, what is the, what is my mission here in the presidency? Um, I think there was a certain arrogance in it, but Democrats have been in power so long uh, in control of the Congress, I mean, entertain the idea you could actually lose the power of the Congress. And so now you're in a, you know, a divided government. Uh, and I think that is, I think that underscores a point, though. You know, that is, these techniques, these methods of, you know, of, of dealing with the public and like, acts in a project um, uh, invites just that kind of mischief to pull on these um, these things, these ridiculous things that have no, have no relationship to the overall project. Uh, the, and so what drives it is not the technique, what drives it is what's the context for it. You know, you know, Dick Morris was working out was, you know, uh, what, what, what triangulation meant for him was he was able to help both President Clinton and the Republicans. Well, if, you had a, if you're a partisan Democrat, and you're, uh, the idea that you were helping the Republicans, you know, in their election in the, in the Congress, that undermines the partisan project. You're not, you're not part of the President's project. You know, fortunately, didn't survive after, you know, the 96. Um, you know, election. So it's it's linked to the the leaders themselves having a, uh, a sense of purpose. The and also the uh, for all these <coughs> leaders, they you know, this is not reflect. It's not about reflecting. Um, you know, it's all the things that you, you know, talked about. All of them, you know, tried to mobilize, engage, mobilize, persuade, um, and but and and voters are fairly you know permissive. You know, they're, I mean, in a, in a, in a narrative, but they're actually, they're very serious um, in a bigger sense. After the 92, after the 92 election, um, I went to Fort Lee, New Jersey, uh, and did focus groups after, you know, after the election, um, about, the, about the time the economic team was being formed uh, and meeting uh, in Little Rock. Uh, the, and I did these focus groups, and I, and I, was, I was looking at the promises that we had made. In particular, middle class tax cut, which was central to uh, to what we had committed to, and we were, we're, it was clear we were going to lose the middle class tax cut in the uh, with the new emphasis on you know, deficit reduction. And even though we had said it over and over and over again, and it advertised over and over again, first voters said, "Of course, you're not going to cut the middle class tax. We would never expect that." Uh, but it was a it was a bigger statement. I don't we don't care about the specific pledges. Uh, we're holding. You know, is he going to act in the you know the long term interest of the country? You know, can we trust him to act to do the right things that for the long term interest of the country? And um, um, is he going to remember us? Remember the ordinary people, not just the powerful people. And is what are you going to do? Is everybody going to contribute? Is every guy going to be part of this? They think they just came out of an era where you know only the middle class paid and you know, the rich didn't. So they had you know they had their demands, but they weren't literal. And they weren't, you know, it wasn't a specific mandate. They were, you know, they were looking for a broader kind of governance, maybe, of the kind you're talking about. Right, but that was kind of a, a push us a little more. Uh, so, the, folks, the leaders come with a mission. I, 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 you know, I get that. And they, they decide this within the context of it. But it, it seems to me there's been a reluctance. We all talk about sacrifice, but there's been a real reluctance on the part of Democratic leaders to ask, ask for actual sacrifice, such as the long conversation about a 50 cent okay, uh, uh, tax on gasoline that if we'd done a long time ago, we might be in a lot better shape now uh, on the environment. There's been a real reluctance to ask people to do, to pay more or to do something, which actually, you know, it's not popular in the polls. And it's, it's what point does the, does the leader say, I understand it's not popular, but it's really important we do it, and I'm willing to follow my sort of it. Well, for, 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 let's put it in context, because these are, these are, this is a change election. And the same thing I would say is true then. This is a. <laughs> <laughs> Am I still here? Am I alive? You're still here. You're still alive. Yeah, it's better. It's better. Um, this was a. I mean, when Clinton came in, it was a change election in which it was after a Reagan and Bush era uh, in which tax rates had been cut for the wealthy. Um, they believed the middle class got you know got squeezed. Their income did not rise. That they thought they had sacrificed. They just went through an just went through an economic downturn. Um, uh, uh, and so, what you're asking at that moment, you know, sacrifice after and shared sacrifice. Let's, you know, let's 
let's reflect the fact that the period that preceded it is one where they believe it's only the middle class that carries responsibility. And so sharing responsibility, you know, meant asking the wealthy to be part of the deal. Um, and I think that's true right now. And we're in a similar moment. Now, our budget did, by the way, the, the original <coughs> budget did have a carbon tax, uh, which did pass, you know, uh, the House. So uh, we get now. The final, the final bill that uh, came out of the Senate, you know, uh, was the was the five cent gas tax. But the administration proposed a carbon tax, which was much bigger. Um, it was, you know, it was a difference between, I think, I'm, I'm, this is rough numbers. I think we were dealing with 15 billion of revenue versus 70 billion of revenue. The carbon tax was a was a more substantial. Um, I remember a little different. Go ahead. Okay. Um, the um, so the, but let me go, but let me go back to, let me go to the point. They have, Abraham Lincoln was solicitous of public opinion. For his goal, he had to be, he had to be, he didn't want to lose the border states um, to the south. Um, he had what he called public opinion bats. He had people come in in mass, which he said was valuable time he spent any week, was listening to the, the, to the people. Um, when he did the proclamation, uh, the Emancipation Proclamation, he didn't do it rationalized by freeing the slave, but by preserving the Union um, and expediting the war. Um, that he, the rationales he used you know, what reflected his sense of how he could you know, keep support for the war effort. Um, he was very careful, very, he was measuring public opinion in his, you know, in his way. And then, and then, Rosa the Green, well, yes, but slowly, carefully measured, changed, you know, care, uh, both wording, went to, you know, timing, um, and, but but trying to reflect, you know, and understand and empathize, you know, you know, the public that was divided, but that he was trying to hold the union together. So leaders that we know that act boldly, you know, are solicitous of the and part of their leadership. The obligation was, um, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm the president. If two thirds are against the war. And, and, and you know, if we're talking about a war, which you, there's been a you know serious debate, two thirds are against the war. The leader has a responsibility to educate and move the party. Um, they, you know, the before you go to war, that's part of the whole process. I mean, I mean, they, Tony Blair, Tony Blair moved, you know, Tony Blair moved the country. You know, there was only about a third in favor of the Iraq War. You know, before, uh, when he when he initially supported it, by the time he got to a vote in the parliament. He had majority support in the country, I and mean, he went out and, and got the country, uh, you know, with him. Um, you know, the, there, uh, there's a, an obligation to bring people, particularly at war, um, to to work, to bring people with you. Maybe the get back to the war. I mean, and, and, and also look at Roosevelt. You know, um, Roosevelt. You know, he was one of the first to use polling. He. Um, he wanted to bring the public along to, uh, to, you know, to, to support Glenn Leakes um, to, in order to support aid to the British leading into World War II when there was overwhelming opposition. He used the fireside chats to persuade the public. He polled. So the first ones he was polling, he polled both before and after the fireside chats to see whether they were successful and moving the public. He, he polled for the agriculture department or something like that. Um, they had some sort of survey research over the agriculture department. Um, I'm not sure. I probably, uh, probably. And, he, you know, and I and I still use you know for uh, a number of but in any case, but he but he recognized that he had to bring the public with him, and he worked at it, and he built on that relationship, special bond that he had with people. So. Yeah. That was, uh, I, I want to get to the floor, but I do want to, let me just ask one more question now. Uh, <coughs> what has been really interesting and notably absent from the Barack Obama campaign? And presence as any sense of someone who's been taking the polls and being the political strategist, or a central political strategist. I mean, David Axelrod has right. his role as being sort of the political advisor, but somehow I can't find anybody who'll tell me how much polling are you guys really doing. I think we're doing up David training, but, <laughs> but, but I don't know what it is, and I don't know where it is, I don't know who's doing it. You know? <laughs> uh, I mean, it's you're right about this. Uh, the, I mean, they had a, a lot of posters uh, in the campaign. I think about four, five posters. Uh, the uh, and, and they're polling and they're polling now. You know, I think Benenson is I think the poster that they use mostly. But uh, Benenson, but not. But you know, I'm not sure in the strategic role 
in the, in the same way yeah. that, that um, you know. Because you were, you were a, a central voice, as I was saying earlier, in the early Clinton years. Uh, uh, Dan, had, Dan was seen as the sort of outside advisor who would come in and give you a very good sense of where the public is and then talk strategy. What's well, the two, I mean, two, I mean, two things. One is my personal history, you know, which, you know, the, yeah. I had a project. I mean, that project, not, I mean, keep in mind, Bill Clinton, leaders bring together teams that, that, that suit their, you know, reflecting their own judgment about the times and, and who should, you know, be there. You, you know, you don't pick the candidate. You know, the, the candidate picks who's there. You know, uh, and, you know, and so the fact that I have been writing, when I have been writing about the throughout the middle class and the, Loss of those voters to the Democratic Party was why he hired me. So you know, so he wrote in his memoir. He said that's why he hired me. So he, he probably because of, of, the, of the world view that I, the political world view that I had. So he was in some sense legitimating what I was doing, making it central uh, in the campaign. It was central to how we ran, and then was you know he wanted me to play that role you know in, in, the, in, the, in the White House. So that legitimated uh, what I was doing. But in American campaigns, it's not true internationally. In American campaigns, the pollster is normally very you know, central because a campaign as an organization is different than other kinds of organizations. You have an election that is, you know, on, on, on one day, it's life and death. You know, it's not, it's not a corporate, it's not like, and you know, we, we do a lot of corporate research, it's not like corporate research in which you can adjust on the next quarter. Everything happens, and the, the result is you've got to theorize your, you know, your election from the beginning. You got to, you know, you have to have different theories of the race. You can test different theories. You then execute, test, adjust, because you can't adjust afterwards. You know, you can't adjust beforehand. So, in an emerge campaign, the pollster is usually quite central, you know, to involve with strategy, you know, and testing the, the, the strategy. Um, and in, in foreign campaigns, you're usually using commercial polling, and it doesn't play that role. But here, it's quite central. Well, let's let's open this up. I, 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 I do. I do. I just want to take note again. I, I have been quite struck that there is how the Obama campaign sort of does not have a Carl Rove type figure and does not have a Michael Deaver type figure. Mm -hmm. it's, it, I mean, they, there. I think there are people doing those things, but they've been very clever and de-emphasizing that or keeping. It's all about the president and the president taking action. Though so my sense is that he has. I mean, look. I mean, he's brought all these, you know, hundreds of thousands of millions of people uh, that he's engaged. Right. Um, and the, you know, the, the, the connection he has with people, you know, is a, a big part of, you know, their, you know, their strength. Uh, he clearly has a feel for public opinion. I know they're doing research, but he clearly has a feel for where the country is, you know, and where the public is, um, and that has that is helped marshal it, um, you know, in this process already. Going outside of Washington, maybe. Bill Clinton would not do it. I mean, we were trapped. Yes, before you came on, actually, we, you know, we, you know, very strong advice from the congressional leadership is that if Bill Clinton would go outside of the country, you know, he would, you know, it would actually undermine his support in the Congress. That he had to, you know, you know, uh, not put that kind of pressure. He did not go on the economic plan at the at the outset and go out and campaign around the country. But Obama's done that within weeks. You know, to, you know, to bring pressure, you know, on the yeah. Uh Please identify yourself and keep the question short just out of respect for everyone else. I just want to say very quickly that we're actually going to raffle off a number of books that have uh, for students. So before you leave, your name, I got a list right here. <laughs> Some of you are on it. Uh, so we're going to do that when questions are done and there will be uh, refreshments and a little food as well. So. Stan will be here to autograph the books. Hi, um, my name is David Bluestone. I'm a master's in public policy here at the Kennedy School. Um, thank you so much for coming to talk with us. It's really fascinating to hear about your your personal, your reflections on your profession and, and the role, the nature of the polling place in, um, in helping leaders uh, in moments of change. My question is about Bolivia, um, and you briefly alluded to the struggles that you had or your experience during and post-election for Goni, um, and you briefly alluded to after his election, Goni ordered the army to open fire on Bolivian protesters, killing 50 um, Bolivian protesters. 
And considering the high stakes of that case, uh, what do you feel are the ethical uh, responsibilities of political consultants uh, in initially choosing which international clients uh, they choose to work with? Thank you. Very, very good question. Uh, the, um, and we, um, and we turned out a lot of, um, a lot of campaigns. Uh, the, uh, by the way, you want me to do uh, question or question? Okay. Yep. And, that, and that question, I think, deserves you know, uh, a direct response. Uh, and it was, it, it, uh, we, even though I said, you know, that, you know, candidate, that the consultants don't pick candidates, that candidates choose their uh, consultants. Um, in this case, we, we were determined to work for good. You know, Goni and it's uh, most people. And I, I don't, I don't, I don't say you're in this position. The most people know Goni through the movie Our Brand is Crisis, which uh, uh, the documentary, the award-winning documentary, um, which I use actually as a setup, you know, uh, for the chapter. Uh, the um, and the, the key, the key missing piece in the, the documentary, uh, and I, it's it's not about uh, the I don't fault the the, the portrayal of, of us. You know, in that election, but um, this is actually one of the um, uh, choice of candidates that I, the one who was very self-conscious about doing it, um, and also as I was writing the book, trying to examine, do I, do I come out of this second guessing that choice? Uh, and I don't want to spend you know that much time, and you know, um, but the, but you should know. I mean, he's a, you know, has a, he was, he was a very bold, you know, reformer. You know, he was in his first in his first time as president. That's not when we worked for him. This is when he was going to run for re-election. He was you know, a very bold reformer. But the let me step back further. Uh, part, probably because I was an academic, um, and and because I did work globally as an academic, I wrote books before I did, before I did any of this. Uh, I was um, and was co-head of the Southern African Research Program, and uh, I came into this with a kind of pro-globalization, pro-trade position. Uh, prior to working for uh, for Bill Clinton, now Bill Clinton was, was also was free, a free trader, which was which was not typical for a Democrat. Uh, and by the way, it was not something we ever polled on, even though just on the other point, we didn't poll on free trade, even though he was being challenged in the primary, you know, by candidates that, that were Harkin and Kerry, um, were running against him on trade and Perot in the general election ran on on the trade issue. We never polled; it was never an issue. He's for it. It was a free trade. Okay. So I had a free, um, free trade position that pre, uh, predates. Um, after uh, after I stopped working for Clinton, you know I you know I worked for you know a number of large companies um, uh, 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 in support of trade associations and support of trade. So I, I argued in favor of NAFTA, you know, during the campaign. You know, and so I begin with a pro, uh, a, a pro trade position, you know, openness to globalization, um, uh, liberalization. So, I mean, that's, what, that's part of my politics, my posture. Um, and he's a bold reformer. He's one of those people who, you know, a market reformer. You know, he's, you know, he's the one, you know, um, you know, Jeffrey Sachs you know, highlights as one of the boldest of the reformers faced the, you know, in Zimbabwe type inflation, you know, came in, crash, you know, course, brought Bolivia into the world economy, um, but, uh, and, and ran for the presidency in support for it. In favor of privatization. This was not something backdoor. He ran for the presidency, supporting privatization. You know, they called capitalization because they, you know, they share. They, you know, they they lock the money away for fear of corruption. You know, abroad they created something called the bonusol, so that the privatization would produce would whip them into the first uh, social security benefit for um, for receiving. Um, also, um, free prenatal, you know, uh, um, care, uh, uh, infant care, um, linked to the privatization. All the money, all the all the money, all the future revenues were locked into that. So he linked, you know, liberalization, um, you know, with social reform. Right. So that was the leader that I worked for. We wanted to work for him when he, you know, when he, you know, ran. Um, now it's a long history. I write about this, um, you know, in the book. You should, you should, you know, should, you know, should read it. Um, and there's a long account of the, you know, the violence that you know, leads up to that moment in which the, 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 the 50, um, you know, die in the, in the last stage of this in October, um, that he ends up, you know, leaving. But there's a history of violence, um, um, you know, to, to overthrow the elected government, 
um, leading up to this whole process. I'm reluctant to second guess leaders who, you know, I had to, I mean, I broke, ultimately broke with Blair on Iraq, on the Iraq war. Uh, you know, the, um, but I didn't quit. You know, the, um, but, I had, but that's where we end up being, you know, uh, separated, was on the, on the Iraq war. Um, but, uh, you know, on this issue, you know, it was exporting natural gas. Okay. You know, we had poll data that said, you know, the, the country's deeply opposed to this, violently opposed to it. Um, in a volatile situation. Um, now, he believed, uh, I think rightly, that the, export, that the natural gas was discovered because of the privatization. would not have happened. These reserves that we're dealing with existed because of the privatization. Right. He believed that they had to export it, and he wanted to lock the money up you know, for education. Right. Well, we said you can't do this. Uh, but, and, and they're using nationalist issues, you know, drumming it up, but yet, you know, against it on nationalist issues. Because of a century old, that Chile had you know, seized the uh, um, the territory leading to the sea, um, and that was being the reason why it shouldn't be exported. That was that was the battle line, you know. And we said you can't do it. He said I don't. He said why? He was a pirate. Describe it in the. He says why am I president? I mean, why am I president? Why am I doing this? I said I'm not here to hold the chair. I'm, you know, the only way to you know, change Bolivia is to is to export the natural gas. Um, and therefore, find a way. Your job is to figure out, you know, how I can get the support for it. You know, we said it won't work. Now, but I also said that about Jerusalem. So, you know, so you know, um, he he was determined to go ahead. Now, we tried the test messages. We found none that worked. Ultimately, it led to the, the violence and this, you know, uh, you know, being thrown out. Um, but it wasn't because the violence. It was in the context of someone who was trying to modernize Bolivia and to lock up those. Resources, um, he believed, yeah, and, and, and advanced social insurance in ways that very few leaders have done. So I'm, so I respect him an immense amount. I don't know about the specific decisions, you know, at the time you know, that, the, that the military was used. I write about them, you know, um, but uh, but it's in a in a big context in which why that was happening. But I did, it was very self-conscious. We, you know, um, and when we we took this client, we you know we saw him as a reformer, and that's why we took. Him. Um, I have a question here. Uh, is, it a, is it a goal, or, or how often does it occur um, where you reach a point when you're either with a focus group or you're running a poll where you just can't get uh, to a level deep enough to, to assist you as a, a kind of advisor to somebody? But when you finally get to the point where you say this, this either this poll isn't sophisticated enough to get to a, a spot where we, I can, I can honestly say this is sort of where opinion lies. And, and does that sort of present an opportunity to some people, or to, to 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 you as an advisor, or is that a constant sort of barrier? And sort of how often does that happen? Yeah, it's usually the opposite. I mean, I, the and I, I almost always learn something new. It's a little harder when you go, you know, when you get further into a campaign and you're testing ads or something. And then you're dealing with, you know, something that's more structured. You know, but before you have the theory of the race and you decide what's really driving this and what you know, what, you know where the power is, the you know, I almost you know always learn something, you know, and I'm almost always impressed with how discerning people are. You know, my I'm, I think the focus groups in Bolivia and in South Africa are much more sophisticated than the focus groups in America. I mean, I, it's never it's not a literacy issue. Um, you know, it is not a level of um, you know. Of, Development education issues, and I've watched. You know, I, and I, I have my notes. I talk about it in South Africa. You know, we were, you know, at the end of at the end of the campaign, and people were holding back. And you know, when I'm dealing with rural African voters who are holding back from the ANC. The question: Why were they? You know, why were they? They hold, you know, holding back. And I went and I did focus groups. Uh, and I decided to go observe them personally. You know, so that I you know, and uh, watch, I watch people. And they, you know, they had they had very clear. Reasons why they're holding back, which had to do that they were scared about. That they were scared that the ANC was giving the you know the youth too much latitude, because in the rural areas where people with much more you know traditional lives and were watching what was what was happening as a result of the ANC seeming to give the youth latitude that they would not otherwise have. They saw impending violence. They were not sure that Mandela and the ANC uh, would restrain the violence. And, but I but I wrote all through my notes. I remember at the time. You know, uh, and I write that in the book. You know, I was writing. I said, 
They have a very specific schedule that they know exactly what, what, what Mandela has promised. They listed, you know, the pledges that you know, said he was, you know, that they, that they said they would do. They listed all the pledges. They knew all the campaign promises. You know, they, you know, we found out immediately. Our problem here is that they haven't, you know, they haven't heard about our message. They knew our message. They knew our pledges. What they doubted, you know, was that we weren't, that we were not going to set off a level of permissiveness and violence that was going to undermine their way of life. And so they were worried about real things. But I would, you know, but I'm, I'm, I'm continually, and in Bolivia, you know, the, um, you know, I watched, you know, when, you know, you know, when uh, Goni tried, you know, to make the case on, 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 on natural gas, they, they knew everything. With I don't, I don't even understand how it happens. I mean, they, you know, they knew he had when he got in as the second time as president, he reinstated the bonus hall. They knew that. They knew that. They knew the amount of the, you know, the, you know, bonus hall. <coughs> on the gas, on the gas connections, he had increased the gas connections to the houses rapidly. Actually, in hopes of getting support for export, so that people could say, "All right, they're getting." They knew it his, in the polls. His job approval went up on connecting gas lines to houses, but down on exporting. They discerned between different policies. You know, and my bottom line is, I think people are very discerning. You know, and I, I usually learn from them. I'm, it's rare that I'm in a situation where, um, you know, I can't do people are thinking. You know, I can't, you know, in Israel, they, you know, the groups are exploded. They explode just sort of the alpha, you know, they explode. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Who else here has a, a question? I, I, I am, uh, please, give him the mic. Thank you very much for being here. I'm, I'm Steve Knight. I'm a master's in public policy student. Uh, one question that I have is uh, about it. Any stories you might have um, of how polling itself, uh, as an act, played a role in public opinion? If there are cases where the act of polling was a determining factor somehow in how public opinion turned out, either in the way that the poll was created or in the way it was reported later on. Uh, good question. The you know a number of a number in a number of cases, not so much the uh, the actual poll, but that. A number of, in a number of cases, the leaders or the campaigns decided that they wanted to call attention, certainly to specific polls that happens all the time. That you'll, you know, if you're a poll, you want to, you know, show that where the race is. I mean, a lot, you know, a lot of what I do is contest an interpretation of reality. You know, President Clinton, you know, gives a, okay, I'll give an example. President Clinton gives a speech. You probably, didn't, I'm sure you didn't like the speech. Um, prior to his. Um, uh, his what, joint session address, comparable to what uh, Barack Obama just gave. You know, a couple days before that, he gave an Oval Office address uh, in which he, um, you know, in which he um, uh, talked about the tax increases that were going to be in the, uh, in, you know, in the plan. And he was not going to go middle class tax. The, you know, wanted to get that out of the way. But the, there were polls. People said the stock market crashed. There were polls that said that he, you know, he supported, you know, and dropped the consequence of that, you know, that, you know, that, you know, that speech. One, but we didn't have any polls. One, as a result of that, we almost always had polls after speeches, so that we were in a position to contest with the media as, you know, what what, what really happened as a consequence. So, you know, so the release of polls, is, you know, is important to interpreting uh, events. Sometimes in, um, in some of the foreign countries, uh, they the leaders will. Want to put a spotlight on us uh, for their own reasons? In South Africa, in South, is that me? Uh, in South Africa, the National Party had brought in Sachi and Sachi and Thatcher had been, you know, Thatcher, um, you know, uh, media person, um, and you know, and, and John Major's uh, uh, media person, and so that they were highlighting that they were running a modern campaign. So the ANC. Decided to have us, um, Frank Greer, who was doing the, the media and I do a, a press conference um, to to match it. Uh, in Israel, um, Ayo Brock was way behind in the polls, um, not taken seriously, not having a chance to win. Um, did a press conference with Carvel, myself, uh, Bob Schrom, um, in order to, and it was a feeding frenzy. Uh, but to, but to create a sense that they were going to run a you know, a tough modern campaign, not like you know, nor other you know, uh, Israeli campaigns, and it had that, and it probably had that effect. But the press took uh, Barack much more seriously. 
Um, you, you, uh, had, you had Carvel and Israel? Yeah, he did. <laughs> <laughs> as improbable as I think. <laughs> And when you read these bubbles, I mean, for the public, especially during the campaign, but even now, uh, <coughs> you know, they're just an explosion in the number of public polls, all sorts of media organizations. Which ones are sort of the class, the top of the class that you can actually put some faith in? I, I, I tend to have a couple of favorites, but do you, how would you advise people well, to, 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 to read these things? Well, that's, first of all, as a starting point, I, I just take the average. <laughs> you do. So well, even, even, you know, even, you know, even, you know, right, uh, even, you know, even given uh, the, you know, the fact that there's some polls are clearly better than other polls, right. there's still, you can't, you can't abolish, you know, sample, you know, you know sample fluctuation that you're going to have a distribution. Um, and so you, you're all, all these polls basically are trying to estimate a real value, and they vary on either side of it, and so the, um, you know, bottom line, the average is the best, is, is, is the, how to start with the average. Then, you have democracy for polls, or polls that uh, James and I do, uh, which I <coughs> would stand up. Uh, but then I would, uh, after that, um, so NBC, Wall Street, NBC Wall Street Journal, um, and um, and actually ABC, Washington Post is um, has, uh, has also been, you know, uh, quite and, good. And where does the New York Times CBS poll fit? Not great. Not great. <laughs> well, I mean, well, that's it. It comes by. Uh, I'm not sure the reason why, uh, the, um, but it used to, it used to be they were not as, um, a lot of this depends on how, um, how often they poll, how much they built into their, into their coverage, you know, a, their own in-house, you know, people who are involved with the, how the weighting is done. The, I watched, watched with that with ABC, I think mean, in particular, their polls have been quite, you know, quite good. Uh, but they, and they're quite transparent about the, uh, the methodology. Uh, what you get with uh, with New York Times CBS is frequently wide variations, um, you know, based on the party distribution, you know, of the poll. One of the problems with polling is that who participates is very much affected by events. So if you're at a time of a Democratic convention and Democrats are more interested at that moment, they're more likely to be polled, to participate in the polls. So a lot of what's reported as swings is really a reporting of different levels of interest. Um, and so then when the Republican convention fades, you know, they, they pull back. It's taken to be Obama winning back those voters. A lot of it just has to do with who's involved. And so there are ways of offsetting that. And the polls that kind of let their polls. I mean, there was a point when CNN's polls, when they, when Gallup, when they did Gallup's, you know, CNN were, you know, were, the, were a menace. <laughs> to the American public, but, uh, but they, uh, they, didn't really, they didn't do, they, didn't, they, they, they stopped doing it um, in, this, uh, in this election cycle. Oh, yes, sir. Hello, my name is Olo, I'm a master in public policy. What was the role of polling in the Clinton health care initiative, and how do you see, how do you think that polling could be used strategically in this Healthcare initiative that's going to be coming out. Yeah, good question. Uh, the um, and by the way, it's a history that I didn't write. It would have been a, 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 a painful history had I written. Uh, I decided in each of these cases to write about the because I couldn't do everything. Um, so to write about the kind of the formative issue that brought them to the, 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 the you know, in their election, which brought them to power. Um, so in the in, so I stuck with you know, he ran on the economy stupid. You know, healthcare was you know was uh, very important. You know, the economy, that's what the, you know, when he got in the, we didn't do health care until, in effect, until the second year. The, you know, the, the, the first state of the, uh, state of the Union joint session was totally economy. So I decided in the book, you know, to focus, you know, on the economy. And so each of these leaders, I'm focusing on their main project. Now, I did the, I did the polling, you know, in the, for the Clinton health care plan. The, uh, which was ill-considered in so many ways. Not the polling, <laughs> you know, but the, about the entire process. What I, what I probably should have realized uh, was when it took a three-day briefing for me to understand it, <laughs> that there was a problem. Uh, the, I thought it was very interesting once I, you know, once I, you know, understood it. I thought it was intriguing, but I really, truly was briefed by the head of the, uh, the initiative, um, you know, three days. Um, um, to, so I could understand the plan, so I could then go and, 
you know, and um, test it. Uh, um, the pro I don't see the problem with polling. And, and probably at some point, either turn over the material to somebody to write the, you know, the history. Uh, the, you know, uh, or I'll write my own, or I'll write my own, you know, history at, at, at some point uh, because it's um, it, it's so important. And particularly if we don't if we don't get healthcare, maybe I'll end up having to write the, or maybe if we pass healthcare, I can write the contrast between the what happened this time and um, and la uh, last time. I don't think I don't I, yeah, I don't think it's the issue with polling. I think it's fundamentally already <clears throat> we've watched a very a very different process. They um, they put healthcare into the budget. You know, their, their their budget you know finds the money. We made a decision not to not to give up care, you know, in the budget. Um, you know, which meant one, you didn't have a fifty vote threshold for passing. The but we uh, we you know we had to raise money for the deficit reduction. You know, we were you know we were raising taxes of various kinds, uh, significantly on the what on the on the on our upper income. Uh, we had a you know carbon tax at the outset. We had tax of, uh, on seniors. We had tax. Um, so there was a there was it was very difficult to go in and find revenue for healthcare in that first budget. All right, but he's gone ahead and identified revenue <clears throat> right in right in the first budget. So there is that's the most important battle here is the money to, to do it. Um, we'll figure out the details. The other piece is he's deferring to Congress on the details. You know we had a whole developed plan before we went to the uh, to the, you know to the Congress. We also had no Republican support uh, before because the process didn't invite it. Uh, you also, you know, the country's changed. It's not just, you know, Obama's come to do this in a different, you know, way. The, you have, you know, all kinds of, in civil society, you have all kinds of groups coming together, you know, business and union coming together trying to figure out how to deal with health care. We've got states that have done the various levels of things, including Massachusetts, you know, to try to address you know, healthcare. Um, that meeting that just took place reflects a lot. You know, a lot of that. That uh, everybody, in a broad way, thinks that they need to be part of this. But we didn't have anywhere near that kind of you know, support in civil society for acting. There were major sectors of business that were you know deeply opposed. I think that's diminished. The unions were not supportive. You know, on paper they were supportive, but since our plan was paid for by raising uh, by taxing uh, Cadillac. You know, healthcare plans. You know, uh, they were waiting until that was, you know, forced out <laughs> before they would be supportive. They also weren't so sure about you know, what, what would happen with their, what they were able to offer for people to be in unions where you get healthcare on having, um, on battling for universal healthcare. So we had, we had very little support on the union side. Anyway, so I think, I think the environment's very, very different. You know, again, <coughs> again, we polled on it. You know, but we uh, we polled with a plan. You know, based on the plan that was, you know, that was came out of this process. You know, um, I mean, if we had done poll, if we had done, we did polling. You know, at the outset, if we had done a plan based on polling, you know, we, we would have offered an employer mandate. You know, be very simple. We were, you know, you know, an employer mandate, probably something to encourage more managed, you know, managed care and comp you know, competition. You know, maybe some caps, you know, some tax provisions that provided some caps on healthcare benefits. Um, and stop. You know, the, the, I mean, the, universe, the most popular thing was an employer amendment. And we probably could have passed it if, that's, if we had started there in the first year and only tried to do that. So you didn't do polling up front before IRA and put the plan together? No, we did, uh, we did poll. So we did poll. We, did, we did poll on health care. It was more on the scope of it. It wasn't on the specifics of it. Right. It was more on the, on the scope of it, goals. Um, but we wait, but we waited till to go out with a plan. We waited until a plan emerged. You know, from, from our, Let me ask one last question. Um, you, you said something very striking in the opening, and, and, and I wonder if you thought it was it, these five leaders that you portrayed in your relationship and their uh, their relationship with their publics. They were all change leaders, and all five had a major. You know, they went up and then they. But that they fell, and then the question was, how do they recover from that? And before, uh, is it something in, inherent in being a change leader, as Obama is, uh, that there's going to be a, a time when things are truly really going to be seen to have failed? And is the real test for Obama going to come after the failure? 
one of your slips things back together. I mean, sorry, mm -hmm. walk us through that as you see that arc. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, it's very different than someone who's elected <coughs> you know, to continue, you know, somebody else's, you know, you know, if you're a vice president and you're elected to carry on, then you continue with the person before you have done. That's a very different election than a, than a change election. But they all, they all create, you know, big expectations. I mean, I mean, the moment breaks. I mean, the you know the you know the people wanting to get rid of the previous administration and what they were you know represented. You know, and, and it's sometimes it's dramatic. I mean, South Africa, you know, the old you know the apartheid order, which you were crashing and you know, bringing in an all racial government for, them for the first time. And so, you know, the, what you're what you're crashing and leaving behind. You know, the 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 fact that it's a change election almost invariably bring has you know has massive energy that brings people into the election. 1992 was a big surge in, you know, turnout, just like we had a big, you know, historic turnout in this election. But, it, but obviously, um, you know, in South Africa, the, I mean, the, these are elections which bring, you know, uh, surges in, in participation. And then, the, you know, and then afterwards, you know, bring, you know, heightened expectation the change is going to come. So it's a, it is natural that those expectations exceed what you can do. And I, what I write here is that I'm, that I'm continually struck by how hard it is to make change, you know, everywhere. You know, the, you know, the, yeah. starting with, you know, the state of finances, which I mean, is almost always, and it's related to the problems that they're elected on, but almost invariably, you know, there's this meeting with the, you know, with the head of the Federal Reserve or the comparable institution that says, well, this, you know, this campaign was all well and good, but, you know, you know, let's now look at reality. You know, these campaign promises were terrific, but you don't really have the money to pay for any of this. Uh, and so there's a, you know, so there's an immediate scaling back, you know, of the, you know, of what you can do. Um, and you know, and you know, there's a, there's some self-deception in the election about what you know about what you can, you know, what you can do. Um, that I think there was for in our case in '92 for, you know, for, you know, Clinton. It was it was very dangerous for Blair. You know, I mean, I'm all for. I think it's particularly you know, win. I think you got to be honest with the public on some things. The and I think Obama's been fairly honest about the pace of things. But you know, when when Blair got elected, they, you know, they ran on um, that they could manage the economy, they could spend it under control. You know, they would not be like the old, like the you know, old Labor, which meant that you know they promised no tax increase in the life of the Parliament. They promised that they would stay within the conservative budgets. The Tory party, the Tory budget, <coughs> for the first two years, and so they accepted a fiscal austerity, you know, to reassure voters. But it was interesting in the polls, you know, as I, the more people felt reassured, the more they were for spending on the NHS, the on the health service. The more the, the, the more people felt confident they weren't going to be wild once they got into government. The more they were, there was a surge in support for spending on the health service. Now, in reality, if you look at those plans. They were not really increasing spending for the first two years, and the first real increase in investments, you know, was in the third year. And they run after, you know, they run into, 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 and they, the, 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 the assumption is they'll run in four. So not until the third, you know, the, right, the year before the election, the next election, would there be any investment? But they left people with the impression that they were doing these in parallel, that they were not, they were not sequential. You know, they, in fact, they needed to grow the economy in order to invest. But they left people with the impression they were doing them together. They were in their, you know, you know, if you look at their materials, it looks like you've got both. And, you know, you got, when you got to Christmas, you know, New Year 2000, you know, you were like you know, two and a half years into their being in office. Um, and the hospitals didn't have any new money. Um, and, you know, there was a, a crisis in the hospitals and people on, you know, straight, um, you know, uh, you know in, the, in the corridors of the hospitals, um, their support crashed. But it was created by the expectation that they could do all this, and they never, you know, Blair never recovered. The drop in trust was, you know, you know, dramatic. You know, for him, trust was the most important thing because he wanted to bring people with him. You know, but it was a crash in you know, trust as a, as, you know, as a consequence. So, you know, this happened as a result of the expectation of change election, but it also happens as a consequence of things, you choices you make on how you make the case, um, and you know, and elections matter. Uh, and, and these expectations, and so then the question is how you, you know, how you bring people back. Um, and you know, a lot of the book is is, the, is a great you know, challenge and different. Same thing happened on, you know, on, on with Man, you know, Mandela. 
you know, when they didn't they plug the drop, they didn't, the housing didn't come through that the, you know that they said they were going to you know, build, um, and required you know a whole new you know narrative, um, you know to be able you know only Mandela could really first of all he got it. I mean they want I mean when I presented it to the you know I, pre I presented the results to the National Executive Committee of the ANC, you know um, showing that they that they had lost people, they had crashed, and about the, their support was about to drop below fifty percent. Um, people were disengaging out of the electorate. Um, they attacked my polls. Um, you know, some people attacked my polls. I wasn't really talking to the right people. Or they were non-representative. You know, representative. But it, um, you know, and who am I to sit here? Yeah, there are moments in this book. You know, sometimes I cite them. And, you know, sometimes I don't. But you know, why, why is this white guy American there telling them? You know, that they have. And I'm telling these leaders who have been in jail for all these years and are fighting the anti-apartheid movement. You know, it just changed the, you know, the apartheid system. You know, creating all, you know, a, a, you know, a, a non-racial government, ending racial segregation, and a range of other changes. Saying that, you know, people, you know, said you, you know, betrayed them. You've broken your promises. You haven't brought change. Um, and so, some leaders get it and are able to. And it'll be the, it'll be the biggest challenge for Obama. You know, because it'll happen regardless of the economy. If the economy were to come back, you know. You know, come back. You know, this would be an easier story. But let's make the assumption that you know people are going to look at a, an economy that doesn't you know, produce you know change. Um, you know, for a fairly long period or perceptible change. It's the thing leaders get wrong more than anything is, is the economy. They because they think they've made a big sacrifice. They think that they've got that they that they got that they they ran on this project. Now they were kind of crashing against the financial realities. They, you know, they have, you know, rolled back what they were going to, you know, do. They have managed crisis I mean, in South Africa. You know, they, you know, and they they got through. You know, there was capital flight. There was the Thai, you know, financial crisis. You know, they think, you know, they would make great decisions. The international community thinks they're doing, you know, great. They're giving them long, lower long-term interest rates. You know, um, but there's no gain in income or employment, which was true of Clinton in '94. You know, true. You know, of, uh, you know. In, in, in Britain, you know, the Tories ran on you know Britain. You know Britain is Britain is booming. That was their billboard. You know it was three quarters of growth, but they people weren't feeling it. Killed it. You know people think they leaders will tout the economy. They think if they don't tout the economy, Bill Clinton bought it. You know no one else will. And I've made you know I've passed this plan. It's very difficult, and I'm going to make the case. It hurt him in '94. It was helpful in '96, but in it is the thing leaders get wrong the most, is being able to talk about the economy of the people, and obviously that's going to be the biggest challenge you know, for a moment. Well, it's, it is rare that you have someone who works across cultures, continents, leaders, uh, and understands the modern, uh, the modern democratic dilemmas, uh, as well as we've heard from uh, Stan tonight. So Stan, we thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Going all the way back to Eugene McCarthy and Robert Kennedy and trying to make for early in his generation, trying to make it early his life, trying to make decisions about supporting them, uh, or which one. He said, I've spent most of my professional and political life in disparate settings and disparate ways trying to recreate a multiracial majority opposed to inequality and private excess and finding ways to build a society where equality and community matter. I think that's very much the essence of who he is. And I wanted you to understand that before we started this conversation tonight. So, Dan, you've had a chance now to reflect. This is the first time you really have written about the people you've worked with uh, in this open, candid way. You've had a chance to observe their leadership. Tell us what you've learned. Okay. <clears throat> um, thank you very much. Uh, the, uh, uh, this is very generous. This is very generous um, of the uh, Kennedy School of the Center. Uh, the uh, IOP to provide this, you know, forum. Um, I came, I came here um, when I uh, published to Americas, and so I immediately went to David um, at the outset of this to um, to have a to begin here. Um, uh, I've had a launch in Britain, a launch in Washington, uh, but this is the beginning of the launch nationally. Uh, so this is one of the first opportunities to speak to a. Um, to a, an American audience um, about the about the book, um, the uh, Jim is great. He's you know um, we uh, 
the, the, the young people who come through always are the folks who teach us uh, about the, the, the country, and they, we, never, we, we appear not to lose uh, track of them, um, as they say, in touch with everybody who still works there. And so we have good networks, strong networks, good parties uh, for those who, uh, who work there. Um, and David, um, I you know admire David. I, you know, I, first of all, I got, I've been watching David as you have, uh, interpreting the last uh, these momentous events over the last two years uh, in, the, in, in the country. Um, I um, I don't know whether David's good. I mean, you should, people I agree with, I think, are smart. And so the, David's very smart. Uh, the, I, but when I look at events as they, as they develop, as I look at a debate or I look at a particular turning point, um, I'm watching for what he's going to say because he usually gets it right. Um, and I also think if we're looking at, if we're looking ahead to how this thing will evolve, I think we try to we go back and recreate those those moments, uh, big, those big turning points uh, just over the last couple of years. I think uh, David will be uh, will have written that history in a, contem in a contemporary time. Uh, I also worked with him in the White House, and the, at, a, at a time when it was very tense, uh, with the president who had, had uh, lost popularity. And one of the, his, my book is about, you know, bold leaders. The wrote it in present tense. Now I didn't publish it in present tense. The, the poor publisher had to, you know, unwrap that. But it, but it, for me, it was a critical piece to being able to say what's going on to keep me from using, you know, the future um, to reinterpret this um, and to, you know, to change the sequence. So. Um, the, but the other piece was getting the, was getting myself to put myself you know into it, and I didn't you know I was not self conscious that this was my goal of life, and that's what motivated um, you know what I did. I wrote that in the introduction, uh, but that's that's something that became clearer to me as I wrote this book, uh, not clear to me um, as I, you know in my life. <laughs> I mean I'm doing it, um, but it, it only became clear to me what motivates me through this through this. Why do I go work for this? Like, why do I, you know, why do I work there? And it's one, it's one of it. Well, part of what motivated the, motive the book was, you know, um, watching the political consulting and polling being um, um, not just the way it was being portrayed, but my increasing perception of what I do um, as becoming manipulative, um, um, turning things to be to be the opposite of what they're intended. Uh, for words that mean the opposite, so that so social security privatization becomes inter intergenerational responsibility. We find words that you know try to communicate the opposite meaning, um, and a sense that it may well be that the techniques that I learned here when I came to Harvard, I came here because you know, he had been um, at, in political science um, at um, at Harvard. Uh, he had uh, he died before, before I uh, came, but he, but he wrote a book that was um, came out that was a half a half written. Uh, called responsible electorate, in which he, you know, which he said that, you know, there's a simple message here, which is that people aren't fools. That they that they care about policy, that they that they that they're, what preferences they have on policy matter, ideology matters, or partisanship matters, um, that information matters, um, and respecting people. But I was in a looking at a consulting community, you know, fraternity, if that uh, that. Um, um, was making, in some ways, making leaders less respectful of people um, and rather being held accountable to people, um, being able to escape accountability. So I wasn't sure, one of my motivations was to figure out what I thought about my profession. Um, I didn't call myself a pollster. Uh, the, you know, didn't self-identify as a pollster. When people use the word, I'd look around and say, what are they talking about? So the um, first was to get clarity on that. And there's a lot, there's, I, I spent a lot of time talking specifically um, on some of the things that you know led me to my greatest doubts, including, you know, including Dennis Ross um, um, saying that the that the Syrian agreement did not happen uh, because of my polls, um, and what does that lead me to, to do rethink or lead me to think about what I do? So I did in time to change and how they struggle to bring people with them. Uh, and as I as I've been talking about the book, I've also it's become clearer and clearer to me that they all crash. You know, they all fail. They all disappoint. They all betray um, the uh, people perceive that they, you know, betray, you know, betrayed their to the what brought them into, into office. Um, we came in at a time when you know Bill Clinton was you know, was strugg uh, struggling to succeed. The White House was, was being reorganized. He came in as a with a history of working in Republican uh, White House. But I, 
Um, I, I think we can look back on, I think, with pride on the, our time uh, together. We always worked together. We, there was always, I think, a trust um, that we have built up, you know, there. I his, trust his integrity on this, his advice that he was giving me, the president, and, and also his patriotism. I think he, uh, I think he came, genuinely came into the White House um, at a time the country uh, needed him at another point of change. Um, and you know, took the chance to serve another president. So, I'm, so I begin this with great respect for David and uh, his role. Uh, this book is a um, is a memoir. But I mean, when I see when I when I hear your words read back, it's very scary. Uh, the uh, um, Uh, very scary when you have your words read back to you. Though this this is a memoir in which I when I when I turned in the book, you know it was 750 pages long. It was like too long, um, and it was not revealing enough. That is, I would that is I would tell I would tell, you know I you know I decided to tell anecdotes that is to tell stories you know as they, um, but this book is so different from anything that I've done. Everything I've done before is it's analytical. Um, it's third person. You know, when I write, I, you know, I throw, you know, I throw ideas at the page. I, you know, I, uh, the, you know, I throw numbers at the page as well. But you know, and it's, you know, and you're, you're engaging, and I can write about write about ten pages uh, a day. Um, but when you write a memoir, um, and I was trying in doing this to be, first of all, fair to the, to the leaders I was uh, writing about. I wanted to try to be revealing about what I do. I wanted to be frank and honest about it. Um, I also want, um, tried to do something, um, I tried to write it in a way, if you read the book, I think you'll see that each of these things have a story to them that, uh, that flows, because I tried in each case to write about it only with what I knew at the time, and never to use things that I could not have known um, to reinterpret what I was doing and saying, because I think you can't read these, you can't get the drama right, you know, um, and, you can't, and you can't understand your thinking. And you know, unless you unless you keep yourself in that first day. In fact, I wrote this in uh, not just first person. I uh, thank you for joining us, Dan. Let me just add a word or two, if I might, uh, to that very fine introduction. Uh, it was some years ago that uh, Lou Harris was one of the early uh, political pollsters, and uh, he gave some he gave the results of his most recent poll to President Kennedy and began to uh, interpret them. And uh, Kennedy famously said, just give me the numbers, Lou, I'll figure out what they mean. As if, you know, I, you just take the numbers, I'll, I'll look at the results. That was a long time ago, and politics has changed dramatically since then. Uh, people who do survey research, uh, uh, and some of them have the kind of, not very many, but a few have the kind of academic credentials that Stan brings to this. Uh, with a doctor here from this university, uh, and Ben Yankelovich from that kind of uh, understanding. Uh, there, there's just been a handful. But over the years, uh, the people who have taken these surveys, some of, a few of them have actually become deeply engaged in consulting and shaping the strategy of the candidate. It's not simply taking the number from conducting uh, uh, focus groups, but it is rather that candidates have looked to them uh, and not only in their campaigns, but then in their governance for help uh, and understanding of the electorate to maintain a bond to the electorate. And Stan has been right at the top of this field, and you heard, in fact, the book. I mean, the fact that you've got the national leaders, he's really writing a book about the national leaders of the United States, uh, of Britain, of South Africa, of Israel, and of Bolivia. I think that gives you some sense of the range that he has brought to his work. Uh, I had the experience and privilege of uh, watching Stan in action during the early time of the Clinton administration. And he was not on the White House staff, but I can tell you that more than anybody I knew, he shaped the strategy of the White House. Uh, he wrote uh, papers for President Clinton and then came in and they became the starting point for all conversations about strategy. And uh, you know, you know, you, the, he who controls the, 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 the document, but controls the agenda, and also controls the outcome. Uh, and that's what he did. But I also want you to understand that uh, Stan Greenberg stands for and represents something 
broader and deeper. He has had a long-term commitment uh, to social justice, uh, and, and, and that's been very important to him. Uh, he, he is married to a member of Congress who shares that passion. Uh, Rosa Blau from, from Connecticut uh, as a Democrat shares that passion. But I want to read you one sentence uh, from his book, early in his book, <coughs> Uh, when he was talking about working for Democrats, as he had. And One was doubts about what I do, but the other was the fact that it was diminishing leaders. Um, that the leaders that I was working for were being diminished by this process, and Bill Clinton in particular, um, seen as a leader who you know, put his finger to the wind, the one who was, you know, I think most attacked as being uh, Paul Um And so part of my motivation was to look at them. I was pretty confident. <coughs> That I would, you know, come away from, you know, come away from this with them, because uh, I understood their their purpose. You know, I came to I came to this because of my purpose. You know, I you know I began it was the Robert Kennedy campaign, 19, you know, 1968 that defined where I stood politically. You know, my generation they're defined by whether you were Eugene McCarthy or Robert Kennedy or Richard Nixon, um, and that you know set you on a course for a you know a life a life. <laughs> The, but so it was, there's a political purpose of what took me into politics and into these campaigns. But all these leaders had a purpose uh, that took them, you know, uh, uh, and, and it was a, you know, particular, you know, moment in time in each of these cases, you know, a, you know, change elections, uh, in which what they were offering, they they were right, you know, they were right for that moment. There are a whole range of other reasons why they emerged to the top at the particular moment. But they they all had. A purpose that was relevant and, and that um, drove the history um, in these critical change, you know, elections. So I understood, you know, that they had, you know, a purpose that took them um, uh, into politics. Uh, I also uh, came to know from the, you know, from the writing of the book, is that these leaders were all complicated and more, you know, and more complicated than I knew at the time, um, and and more, much more interesting. And so. And again, going back to the reason why I wrote the book, I looked at the, the political leaders were being diminished by the campaign, the perception of the campaigns they ran, um, and the use of you know consulting and polling and uh, you know to advance their issues. Uh, when in fact I understood that they had a much you know bigger purpose. You know, Nelson Mandela was consumed, I mean Mandela with Paul, um, and being in touch with people. Nelson Mandela. No, Nelson Mandela was consumed with Paul. He went to focus. Uh, he, uh, you know, act, there were critical turning points uh, in the ANC, both his campaign and in the period of governance. You know, where he got it, uh, where others didn't, um, uh, and because he, you know, he viewed as part of being a leader. Um, that, in fact, was this that was this aspect of him, to some extent, with Clinton. Um, that um, and then beginning to be, then getting a sense of other leaders like uh, Lincoln and, and Roosevelt, that I decided that leaders' solicitousness of the solicitousness of public opinion actually made them stronger leaders and more likely successful leaders. I think it normatively. That